Um, trying to give a supplier perspective on um, you know, the digital engineering and, and what we call digital product life cycle. Um, and, and so I think a lot of what was being discussed um, and, and how the Army is going to have to deal with, with this across their enterprise is very similar to kind of what we're seeing as a large aerospace company. Um, we have lots of different capabilities. We have lots of different you know, legal entities with different ways of doing things. Um, so, you know, when you start pulling systems together from different suppliers, I think you'll see a lot of the same poten potential issues. So we'll talk to that a little bit. Um, Young is going to talk uh, about our digital product life cycle, which is our approach to how we're doing uh, digital engineering across the enterprise. And it's good to hear that, that you know, kind of talked uh, today a bit about different pockets of how that's being applied through life cycle. And we'll kind of give you a nice, some, some, uh, examples of how we're applying that, um, looking at different parts, or what we call the digital st uh, strings um, of, of execution that kind of group uh, related activities together. And then we'll just kind of we'll close out here with some, some remarks. But um, yeah, so so for, first off, I, I wanted to, you know, you know we, we definitely get it, right? We, we're seeing the, the pull for uh, digital engineering across all of our businesses because we, you know, we deal with the DoD um, and and the commercial uh, uh, OEMs uh, like Boeing and Airbus. Um, so we get it. We're we're seeing the the, the pull in different areas for, for a long time. Um, so so we are taking action to to go enable digital digital engineering across our company and try to figure out the right way to do that. Um, we also, as a supplier, you know, we we're actively working with OEMs and working with the Army. So we see, uh, I'll call it a, 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 a non-differentiated um, request for digital engineering, model-based engineering. Um, doesn't really matter what the system is, but we can receive consistent requirements come, being flowed down to us, which is good, but also we, you know, as a supplier, have to figure out how we deal with that a little bit from a, uh, when we answer the call for, for a proposal, because um, not everything's created equal. You know, we have lots of diverse businesses, lots of diverse products, um, and today we're not unified. We're definitely not there. But what Young's doing is trying to figure out a way to, to get closer to that and, and, and iterate um, over time to, to, to be more consistent and have a more uh, equivalent capability across the company. Um, but we have lots of diverse products, right? In, in, diverse, in different stages of development, um, you know, if you look at uh, air data systems, for example, we have very mature commercial products, um, and we've, you know, want to apply those and use those on future vertical lift. But to, um, to, uh, you know, enable or to, to, uh, you know, execute a program where we do lots of like kind of call it re reapplication or reverse engineering of of things just for the sake of making them, you know, consistent in a model-based environment, uh, doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Um, but then we have other things that are definitely uh, in the middle of, you know, what we need to, uh, you know, uh, and there's a lot of benefit to the to the customer to provide that capability, like for mission computing, for example, where we we know there's a lot of need for future supportability, modularity, um, and and insight into the architecture. So, so we struggle a little bit with how, how to apply that and how to, how to you know, get the best value across the company. Um, and I think that's something that SVL is going to see as well as a, as a um, and I think Mike mentioned it too, as, as far as an OEM, you know, the, the not all suppliers and not all products are created equal. So we have to, um, you know, figure out how to, how to best apply those uh, strategies and, and where the best value would come from in terms of, uh, integration into the overall architecture. So uh, with that, I'll let uh, Young talk a little bit more about the specifics of what we're doing uh, for, for DPLC. All right, thanks, Harold. Yeah, so so you know, just to set a little bit of context and, and to um, connect to what Harold just mentioned, right? So Collins, um, you know, 15,000 engineers were organized into six business units and our sort of content is quite diverse and, uh, and ginormous, right? Um, and we have, as, as individual sort of legacy companies had 
have had a rich history of developing um, digital and model-based capabilities uh, in pockets where, um, where, where it made sense. And more recently, we started to look at the entire landscape from sort of the enterprise perspective and stood up this initiative. So this is at an enterprise level across all of Collins that we're calling um, DPLC or digital product lifecycle, right? And here, I mean, you can read the words, but our objective is to you know, integrate and deploy model-based digital capabilities across the entire product lifecycle. So not just engineering, but we're also recognizing that when we talk about you know, industry 4.0, IIoT initiatives that are going on, um, PHM capabilities and how you um, better support our products in the field, um, there are activities that are going on here that really make sense to try and um, integrate and, and um, attack the problem collectively, right? So from an enterprise perspective, our objectives and our mission is to really identify the kinds of solutions and capabilities that are most reusable across the various different product lines, and also to make sure that there is a clear sort of integration between a lot of these siloed capabilities and, and functions that, that have traditionally existed. Um, and to do that, so we've taken DPLC and decomposed it into what we call digital strings. So you, you'll see these acronyms DSs, and, and th that's our sort of terminology for doing a little bit of decomposition so that we can provide a layer of structure when we start to talk about capabilities, right? And, and so far to date, we have five digital strings that we've identified. This isn't um, meant to be a static list, and we expect this to evolve over time. Um, but let me you know, walk you through a, just a brief description of what's sort of in scope for um, these five digital strings. So starting from the first one, DS1, which we call um, the code developed requirements models and architecture trades. So this use case typically applies to the, the early bid and proposed phases where uh, we're really looking to use models to more formally capture architecture requirements and perform early concept architectural trades. So model-based engineering, uh, systems engineering, and BSE, that's uh, an example of a capability in the string. But we have others here that we have our eye on, um, things like the use of um, these modeled requirements for analysis, uh, for requirements validation, and also frameworks that allow us to more intelligently um, explore architecture trade spaces more in an automated sense, and be able to do a more complete uh, exploration of the trade space. The second digital string, DS2, is virtual integration. And the objective here is to basically maximize the use of models in our design um, to perform integration or verification activities as, as early as possible. And using models here it, you know, can really help significantly reduce our dependence on um, long lead time hardware. Um, and it also allows us for uh, to do a more complete evaluation of whether that's integration, checkout of functionality, or um, simulation or analysis of larger operating envelopes. Example here for capabilities, the, the traditional sort of typical mill sill hill progression, the model in the loop, software in the loop, hardware in the loop type of progression. Um, another um, capability that we're working on is um, concurrent and virtual distributed integration. So being able to integrate and simulate a set of models um, that might be physically distributed geographically in, in, in different organizations. The third one, DevOps, DevStarOps, uh, is basically the adoption and deployment of the modern, uh, what they call CI/CD or continuous integration, continuous deployment capability, predominantly for software development that's already, I would say, pretty mature and well-practiced outside of our industry. Um, but you know, where I, I would say we as an industry and, and Colin specifically are, are lagging in this area, right? Um, but here, the nuance here is that it's not solely focused on um, the automation of the traditional software development process, but um, we're also looking to incrementally uh, inject model-based capabilities. Things like model checking, um, automated test case generation from models themselves, and then the seamless integration of, of for example, software code that's developed from these, these DevOps pipelines into higher tiers of model-based uh, verification that, that I mentioned in Digital String 2. The fourth string, Producibility built in by simulation. Um, so this is a use case at the interface between engineering and production. Um, and here, our immediate focus is on two capability. Uh, the, the first one is uh, a singular model-based definition or representation of our product um, as the authoritative source of truth um, that's used both by engineering and production. And then the second is the um, capability to leverage these models to do um, 
what people refer to as DFX analysis, right? Designed for X, such as cost, producibility, uh, inspectability. The fifth and final string is um, digital, string, digital thread for in-service support. And this, is, uh, this represents the digital or semantic connectivity and relationship of data and, and models that represent our products. So being able to um, seamlessly link requirements to design to analysis, simulation, verification, certification artifacts to how the product was actually built to how it's operating and being serviced, right? That, that entire um, digital thread um, that connects not just the models, but also the, the relevant data. So for all of the five digital string, the, the, some of the examples that I just cited um, are, are actually drawn from, from what, I, what I would call examples of proof points that um, exist um, or have been demonstrated in at least one or multiple of Collins product lines. Um, and, the, and one of the near-term priorities that we have is to deploy these capabilities across broader Collins. So I'm just gonna take two of these and give you a little bit of a flavor for, um, you know, with examples of, of what they entail, right? So looking at digital string one, um, code level requirement model. So I'll very quickly go through the current pra practice. I think with for this crowd, you know, this is, this is nothing new, right? Where on a new platform, we at Collins have responsibility for as ma many as 30 to like 50 systems, right? And so on a new program, each system has multiple suppliers and um, we're all working with the customer to understand, refine and update the system architecture, the interfaces, the requirements. And the primary challenge here is that you got so many things going on, so many changes um, and you know can't maintain consistency and correctness of the requirements, the interfaces, the specification as they're being made real time, right? Um, especially when you're maintaining that and keeping that documented as hundreds of, uh, of textual um, documents, right? So in the DPLC practice, the objective is to, you know, capture these as, as uh, specifications, as models. Um, you know, two main differences when we, from a Collins perspective, when we look at it uh, relative to the traditional approach, um, you know, sort of a singular concurrent system model. So everybody's working on the same model, updates are real time, and everybody has access to the same consistent set of information. And then the second piece is, I, and I alluded to this earlier, is um, some unique capability um, that we're bringing to the table where um, we have technology that allows us for certain types of requirements models to apply automation and analysis techniques, right? So um, ensuring that the requirements are correct and consistent in a way that's not possible um, through the traditional um, validation by review of textual requirements. Um, and, and the value proposition here is that this approach allows us to get to um, stable architectures much faster um, and avoid some of the late oops findings that we have um, because of incorrect requirements um, and, or interface errors that that persist and and are found you know um, too late in the program. All right, so let me now walk you through an example of uh, you know DS1 digital string one um, from two of our product lines, the proximity sensing system and the fuel management system. Um, and on the, I'll start on the right-hand side with, with some of the challenges on for these product lines, right? Um, that there's been a, a history of program cost overruns that were pre pre predominantly driven by software verification and rework. Um, and, and in looking in, at the root cause investigation and parading why this is happening, um, it turns out that 50% or so of all of the rework is actually coming from incorrect system requirements that have been flowed down to software. Um, now these systems typically, uh, for both the procs and the fuel systems, you know, um, typically contain an order about a thousand, um, I would say discrete, logical, Boolean type of requirements that are actually very amenable to uh, be modeled as mathematical constructs. So for these two particular systems, um, Collins worked jointly with the customer um, in, in one of our newer development programs to develop a set of requirements models um, uh, allocated to software. Uh, but again, trying to move from textual requirements to models, requirements models as, as the authoritative source of truth. Um, these models were then um, able to be analyzed for consistency and completeness. And from the same validated models, um, we have some internal technology that we've developed that allows us to automatically generate the test cases for software verification. So in this particular example, we're essentially following the traditional development process for system requirements validation and software verification, but we're really injecting model-based capabilities and automation 
um, in areas where it makes sense, right? And, and in doing so, able to reduce the overall software development effort, at least for these two exemplar systems by about 30%. But also allows us to respond much faster to changes and requirements of design, which inev invariably um, you know occur on a program, with much more higher and consistent quality. Right. All right. Next slide, please, Harold. Yep. All right. So the next one is is DS2 or virtual integration. Um, and there are many different aspects and capabilities to virtual integration, but the challenge here that I want to articulate is, um, is how to overcome long development times associated with um, complex cyber physical systems, right? Where you're really reliant on the traditional side on hardware as the primary method for system demonstration. So on the right-hand side, there's a simple depiction of the, of the traditional process where you do a bunch of design, and then you, know, you wait for the hardware to be built, you finally get it, you integrate it, you go to test, um, and you find a bunch of super interesting learnings, um, but then have to go back to the drawing board to iterate or correct issues, um, and you rinse and repeat, right? And the hardware wait time um, and the dependence on hardware to do these um, demonstrations um, is, is taking too long, right? And, and in the DPLC virtual integration approach, um, what the objective here was really looking to compress and accelerate this learning loop by maximizing the use of component and system models and really selectively rely on development hardware for elements where we know we have low maturity uh, and therefore the, you know high risk to the program so this is in some ways this is this is sort of the, the agile devops type of mentality uh, uh, or, um, or or thought from the software development right we want to be in a in a mode of continuously learning and our main challenge here was like how do we accelerate the time to each incremental set of learnings that we can do. So next slide, please. Yeah, so this is a specific example. And, and the application here is a the next generation environmental control system. So this is the system that, that typically conditions a bleed air uh, for cabin heating, cooling, and, and pressurization. Um, and for this particular product line, um, there's been a history of challenges with the control system validation primarily due to sort of the complexity and the very tight coupling between the, the thermo, th thermodynamics, thermophysical system behavior, the control architecture itself, and the sort of the challenges associated with actually getting this equipment arranged and installed um, in, in, the oper in, in the sort of installation envelope. Uh, and in some, some aircrafts, right, or some applications, this sort of lack of complete control validation can be as benign as you know your your responses their transient responses are you know slower than desired and in more severe cases um, we've seen um, instances where the system is not stable we have limit cycling of the system um, and leads to premature failure uh, of components and, and higher expo warranty exposure and customer dissatisfaction right so on this next gen system um, we were working with a customer um, that was really looking for a, a, I would say, a pretty radical change in the system, right? They were looking for a 50% efficiency reduction, which really necessitated um, building a, I would say, a pretty new system architecture, uh, both building and, and demonstrating. Um, now, the fortunate thing here was that this product line um, already had a very sort of strong systems modeling capability that was used for system design. Um, and on, so on the left-hand side, you kind of see this sort of merging of this hybrid approach that um, uh, that we use, where um, you start out with the various models for the system design, the 3D installation model, and the thermodynamic performance and dynamic models to do the initial design. Uh, and then for, for, the, for the elements in the architecture, you know, LRUs, line replaceable units or components that were the highest risk items, they were identified um, and those were selectively um, prototyped, right? Like the air cycle machine, the ACM, the heat exchangers, et cetera. Um, and then as these development hardware were um, brought online, they were integrated into the system model. So you had this case of, of this hybrid hardware in the loop um, uh, uh, system model. Um, and this really helped accelerate the learning and really resulted in reducing the entire development time from the typical three and three to four years to, um, to about two years, right? So, so again, Another sort of consistent example in that, just like the DS1 um, that I talked about previously, the approach here wasn't really to introduce a brand new model-based development approach. 
we were utilizing sort of this hybrid integrated model and physical system approach, um, but it was really following the quote unquote traditional development program, um, process in a way that allows us to allow us to compress the development timeline. But we were still relying on, you know, once fully validated through this hybrid approach, a full up hardware build for verification and certification. So, so a lot of a lot of information there, um, and and we kind of gave you an insight into some of the things that we're doing. And like Young said, it's we're not necessarily looking to like wholesale replace all of our engineering uh, with with a model based approach. Just applying it where it makes sense, and doing that, taking that approach holistically across our enterprise to make sure that we're you know getting best advantage of that. Um, I think I think one of the important things that, that Young was talking about in both these examples is that the approach is, is interactive, it's iterative, and you, you get to really get the advantage out of it. It has to be really collaborative or you can work with your customer to, to develop requirements. You can work um, you know, with different teams to optimize design um, and, and structure the models to do the right types of analysis. Um, so, so you're you're getting the results that you that you that you want, right? Um, it's not just modeling for the sake of modeling. It's modeling to provide value, to to um, do the right kinds of analysis and, and apply it in the right way. Um, you know, so the, the proof in the pudding is I think for for the army is 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 driving this through the entire life cycle. Um, Making sure that we're doing the right things in the right places. Um, you know, the, uh, one thing that that Young had taught me, uh, told me earlier was, you know, we're not really looking to, like, necessarily create one source of truth, one one environment. There's different, going to be different tools, different different ways of doing things, um, and we should make sure that they're interoperable so that we can can uh, work across different programs, different industry partners in the Army. Um, using the same standards and making sure that we can, you know, drive that that inter interchangeability or interoperability. Um, and a challenge, I think, for us, we haven't really figured it out ourselves yet. And there were some questions earlier. Um, uh, I think uh, when Paul was talking from Bell about certification, um, you know, we're really not looking to go 100% model-based certification. We're looking at models as a way to augment the process, to capture uh, information. Um, and, and but you're still going to have to supplement that with with uh, traditional methods uh, in a way that that satisfies the, the folks that are going to certify these systems. Um, you know, we got to bring them along with the process, and, and and we're learning all learning at the same time. So I think that's that'll be a challenge for for us going forward is to figure out how we how we carry this through the end and make sure that when we're when we're done, we have something that we can that we can certify and fly. Um, so. Questions there, I think we're kind, of, we're kind of up against our limit, but if there's a few questions uh, from the group, that'd be great. Doing an excellent job at it, adhering to the intent of uh, the Army's uh, desire to contain the accumulation of technical debt. And I think that you're also internalizing things and making sure that as you guys move to an operational model, you're uh, ensuring that you're bridging the past ways of operating with future ways of operating. And I think those two observations are key because every organization that's going to be working uh, in the extended enterprise is going to have to come to terms with those approaches. Just a comment. Yep. Yeah, that, that was one thing I guess that occurred to me is that if we were going to have an area to, of focus for this group that might be one of the things that we have to look at right how do we how do you bridge those gaps um not everybody's going to be at the same level of maturity the same level of capability uh, but you still want to have the right information to support what you're what you're doing holistically um with these systems when you when you you know go to program record so i that to me is a, is a challenge that we're trying to deal with um but i think it's going to going to come uh, to fruition um, in, in reality for for the Army and, and the DOD in general as we start to apply this across the enterprise. 
Well, yeah, well, I, well, I look at your agile, your yeah, hybrid program that had some agile attributes. Uh, I, I struggle to understand how the agile process works well in a certification methodology. How, how do you expect the, the certification officials to be able to adjudicate the status of your product if it's constantly being updated to an endpoint? Yeah, so, so far, I, I totally, totally resonates with, uh, resonate with your question, right? I, I think on from a hardware-based system perspective, it's a big challenge, right? And that's why the example that you saw was really using sort of the agile approach to um, to get to the solution faster, right? But we, 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 haven't, we haven't figured it out or even answered the question as to whether it's possible to apply agile or sort of the, the software DevOps mentality in a certification environment, right? So we've just used it to accelerate um, how we get to the endpoint faster, but still relying on um, basically the, the sort of the tried and true traditional approach of hardware-based verification and certification for now, right? I think there's probably got to be a lot more sort of discussion and, and work and reasoning about um, w whether an agile um, type of an appro incremental approach is, is really suitable for truly hardware-based systems. Okay, understand. Thank you much for the presentation.